David Bonsall from Oxford, who will talk about um, high throughput sequencing and viral load quantification assay. Hello, uh, my name is David Bonsall. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present at this conference. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a comprehensive genomic-based solution um, for HIV surveillance in a global health setting. You can ignore the title, it's terrible. But, uh... So um, I, I work with um, uh, POPART, uh, which is the largest clinical trial of treatment as prevention, uh, based in Zambia and South Africa, that uh, compares a standard of care to a package of heightened disease surveillance, rapid linkage to treatment, uh, and other preventative measures. The phylogenetic substudy will sample 10,000 um, um, sample 10,000 patients in Zambia uh, and, and generate uh, sequence data from that in order to map out uh, the transmission events and the infections identified in spite uh, of the interventions. Um, now, with traditional Sanger-based uh, sequencing, um, you can identify the links within um, the population. With deep sequencing, you can actually identify the direction of transmission and therefore the transmitters in the population, which is important because it allows you to identify the factors associated with transmission, be that the role of acute infection, migration, the role that drug resistance is playing at the population level. So our method starts with 500 microliters of plasma. We extract the total nucleic acid from that plasma and we generate our sequencing libraries from the RNA component of that using the uh, smarter uh, kit uh, commercially available from Takara Bio. At this point, you can expect about 1% or less than 1% of what you've got in your sequencing library to be HIV. Um, and so we enrich with a panel of oligonucleotide probes that we've designed to capture the epidemic diversity of HIV. After that, between 60 and 90 percent of everything that you've got uh, will be HIV. Uh, we sequence on the Illumina instrument, and we've optimized this for our pipeline um, so that a single technician manually can actually process 384 samples in a week at the cost of 30 pounds, or about 40 dollars, per sample. We, this is part of a comprehensive pipeline for estimating viral load, identifying these transmission networks, and also predicting drug uh, resistance all within a single test. Before you do any of that, you need to be mindful of the possibility of sequencing artifacts and contamination getting into your data. We control for that with physical controls we put into our sequencing runs uh, and with bioinformatics solutions for removing them. Uh, Shiver is a pipeline that turns these short fragments of sequence, the data that you get back from the next gen approach, into whole genomes. And Phylascanner is really the workhorse pipeline that generates our transmission networks that uh, Chris Wyman and Matthew Hall have uh, developed and published. Uh, from a single infected uh, uh, person living with HIV, you can expect to obtain uh, maybe 100,000 virus uh, sequences. Um, and uh, so what we do, what Phylascanner does, is uh, takes all of, and each one of those sequences represents a fragment of a genome of an individual virus particle within that individual. We take all of those sequences and we align them in these giant super alignments to generate these phylogenetic trees. Um, and you can see an example here. And when you look at these trees, what you see is that some swarms of virus live, uh, within individuals appear to emerge from, oh, appear to emerge from other swarms of virus. Um, and he, so in this example, you can see that the red patient appears, to, the red individual appears to have infected the blue individual. That gives you the direction of transmission. So the first 1,622 participants in the trial generated about 400 million uh, sequences. Uh, and uh, uh, after enrichment, about 68% were HIV. Uh, the Phylascanner pipeline is what we use to actually identify, also identify the contamination sequencing artifacts uh, that are a problem for next-gen data, and we remove those. Our sequencing is quantitative. You see in the top figure here that viral load correlates strongly with uh, the number of reads that we get out. It's so quantitative that if we include a standard curve of clinically validated quantitation standards in every run, we can actually estimate viral load from this uh, $40 test. 
To date, we've recruited 5,500 participants. We've completed the sequencing on 3,646 of these. And uh, the complete purple lines in the figure on the bottom left represent whole genomes that we've uh, managed to obtain for each of these. You can see a few white spots, uh, and they represent um, uh, sequences that we haven't managed to get. But a proportion of, our, uh, of, our, of the people we're recruiting are actually not viremic, so we wouldn't expect to be able to get all of them. The cutoff is about 1,000 copies to generate a whole genome with a minimum coverage of about five reads. If you, want, if you just want a whole genome, actually the cutoff for a successful whole genome sequence is probably just less than 1,000 copies per mil. We, our focus on drug resistance reflects a global concern. So in 2017, the World Health Organization have published a report identifying parts of the world where up more than 10% of individuals harbor drug-resistant virus. And the modeling is clear that as we get better at rolling out treatment, we can expect reduced prevalence, but we can also expect an increased proportion of drug-resistant virus. Um, and the recommendation is more drug resistance testing integrated within surveillance programs. We feel that these, this, this assay uh, costs us $40 uh, a test is a, a significant advance on the kind of, uh, the, the, the kind of money that, that the World Health Organization was thinking they would need to spend. Uh, and it also is generating a, um, a, a useful molecular epidemiological data from the whole genomes as well. It's not just about the sensitivity and the throughput. Actually, we feel that uh, next-generation sequencing gives you better information on drug resistance within an individual. If you take this individual here, each line uh, represents a sequence of a single virus particle sampled from that individual. You can see the mutations I've highlighted with green, uh, green diamonds. Now, that little squiggly bit on the top is basically the sum of all of those mutations. If you go down the column and you sum them up, that's how we're used to seeing our drug resistance information at the moment. That represents a Sanger consensus sequence. If you compare this individual, actually this individual has exactly the same number of the same mutations at the same place within the genome. The consensus sequence on the top is actually exactly the same. The difference is, if you look in the green individual, all the mutations are clustered on individual virus particles. There are virus particles in the green individual are that are therefore much more resistant than the, uh, than the virus sampled from the red individual. Here's some real data <clears throat> identifying two individuals. The tree on the left gives you the phylogenetic structure of the, of the sequences we've sampled from these two individuals. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the individual at the top, individual A, the heat map on the right uh, gives you the level of resistance to all of the drugs, the NNRTIs and the NRTIs that I've, uh, that I've shown uh, at the top. And um, what's interesting about this figure is that there are um, sequences within this individual that have six or more mutations, six mutations all linked on the same sequence. Another interesting uh, observation is that the most ancestral sequences in this individual that root closest to the root of the tree here are actually the least resistant, suggesting that more mutations were subsequently acquired, one on top of the other with time in this individual. Actually makes sense. This individual was exposed to treatment before they were recruited uh, to, the, to the clinical trial. That gives you interesting information about the evolution of the virus within the host. Perhaps you've second-guessed that we would like to use this information to look at the evolution of virus, uh, resistant virus spreading through populations. Um, but actually, we feel that we need to do this in order to, um, to get a feel for the overall level of resistance uh, within individuals uh, um, uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to, to the drug. So this time, each uh, branch of the tree, each leaf of the tree, uh, represents an a whole um, HIV genome. So there are about 300 individuals here, and I'm only showing a sample of individuals from the trial who have one or more uh, drug-resistant mutation to at least one uh, drug. And, um, and what we see is not um, surprising. It doesn't conflict with what's been previously published. The majority of the resistance we see is against the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, particularly of favorens and nevirapine. And there are one or two individuals who have uh, multi-drug resistance, uh, the NRTIs in addition. So that just leaves me to thank our um, collaborators. 
uh, and uh, our partners, the people who did the work in Oxford, and uh, particularly those uh, working in Zambia, collecting the samples and, uh, and, and delivering them. I'd like to thank our, our principal funders uh, and, of course, uh, the participants uh, and the com communities from where they come. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Are there questions? The audience, yes. Oh, Pietro. Yeah, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Since you have the possibility to look at transmission events mm. and resistance, I wonder whether you could observe whether resistant viruses were less likely to get transmitted? Yeah, that is, um, that is something that um, we, we'd like to look at. And I think the, the quantification uh, within the assay is very important to that question as well, because, of course, um, you, you're linking a resistant phenotype to, to, to the viral load, uh, which is a, 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 a perhaps a measure of, of fitness, uh, and also certainly a, uh, certainly a measure of, um, of the likelihood of transmission of that virus. So, yes, that is something that we're doing, yes. Just a quick question. How many... To, to identify a mutation as a resistance mutation as opposed to an error, how many um, reads do you have to have to, to call that confirmed, especially in, like, the red patient where mm. you had, like, one on each different strand, which... Um, yeah, so actually the, the branches on the tree represent unique sequences, uh, and each one of those sequences might have a read, a, a read count. Right. Um, we deduplicate our data, so we're removing our PCR uh, duplications before we do that analysis. If it's worth thinking that you could, can, you could incorporate that within your, uh, your measure of uh, robustness, if you like, because, in fact, um, uh, you know, th th those PCR duplications are, 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 in fact, you know, replicates of the same bit of sequence that you've sequenced. So... Um, uh, we, we, it's, it's difficult. I mean, at the moment, we, what we're aiming for is to kind of replicate the, uh, the, the, the cutoffs that are used with consensus Sanger sequencing. Um, and, and so we're going, we're thinking that the, a useful threshold uh, is to replicate that kind of 20% uh, and uh, with a minimum, with a, perhaps with a minimum read count to support a mutation. But, the, but I think that the, 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 the real trick and the benefit is to look at the reads individually and to look at the resistance profile of each individual read, because then you get the epistatic links between the mutations on the reads. I think that's the benefit. Are you able to predict the uh, recency or chronic versus chronic infection through analysis of envelope or other algorithm from your genome? Yeah, that's a, that's a really um, a good question, and also a minefield for our group, and it's something that we're working on. Um, the... Uh, the, the, we're doing that with other, um, uh, in, in other cohorts, um, where we have other information to, in, to perhaps validate uh, a measure of, 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 of recency. We're doing um, uh, the serology and the viral loads to support that, and we're hoping that, yes, there is a measure of, resistant, uh, a measure of diversity that, will, um, that, that, can be, um, that can inform that. I think the challenge, though, is the proportion... Uh, let me get this right. There's a, there are a, a proportion of individuals who, have, uh, have may, may, who may have been infected for a long time a very, who have a very low-level diversity... Uh, and, and, and they can be mis um, they can be misinterpreted sometimes as. Thank you very much. The um, dominance of the NNRTI resistance that you showed was very impressive, mm. and I assume that was all sub-Saharan uh, specimens, um, sub-Saharan Africa. So, so I, I need to be I want to, I want to be clear. I mean, the, we, we are we're halfway through this uh, this analysis, and this is a proportion of um, of the. Uh, of, 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 of the pop art um, people that we've sequenced to date, and um, uh, we, um, so so we're, I'm only showing the, um, the 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 resistance that we've. I'm only showing those individuals that have some some level of some level of resistance. The, for re, for us, the the the, um, the priority was making sure that the that the that the method is um, validate valid and and correct, you know and, and the right. Way of looking at this resistance because the data is so is so is so important. But I don't think what we're seeing differs from what the World Health Organization have uh, of, of, have already um, published, particularly in, specifically in Zambia. Well, assuming that the methodology is sound and, mm. and will uh, be support, uh, receive support in mm. the future, will you have opportunities to analyze specimens from uh, elsewhere in the world where single dose nevirapine was never rolled out, such as the U.S. or Brazil? 
Yeah, so, yes, and, and we're, we're very, you know, we're keen to do that. I mean, the first thing we're going to do about that specific question, you know, the role of nevirapine might have played and, and, and monotherapy of nevirapine in, um, uh, in pregnant women is, is, to, is to look at gender and the association with uh, an NRTI resistance in you know, men and women. Um, we're very keen to get our method out, actually, to, you know, to parts of the world that can benefit from this most. We've got collaborators in South Africa and... Uh, and and, and, and Uganda and, and, and other parts of, of Africa. And, yeah, um, I'd be interested to talk to you if you've got access to samples from Brazil. Just one question. Um, when you, so you're showing that cartoon with uh, multiple mutations linked in the same sequence. Yes. So our, uh, we know that with deep sequencing, we have very short reads, so yeah. linking mutations is difficult. Yes. So how far apart can you link mutations? Yeah. How much... Uh, can you speak so, so our, um, uh, our two, we spent two years basically optimizing um, insert size, um, and you are and, and it, it's tricky because everything in molecular biology favors what's the easy, the, the easy uh, shorter fragments. Um, so um, more than fifty percent of our libraries are now over three hundred and fifty bases in length, which is uh, which we've done some work to show that that is a kind of absolute cutoff for, for getting meaningful phylog within host phylogenetic information using the phyloscanner scanner pipeline. Phyloscanner, scanner, of course looks at this scanning across the window, so, uh, so, so scanning across the genome. Um, and so you, 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 can, you can cope with reasonably short, uh, short reads. Um, um, but, and, and the answer, and if to, to, by the way, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a combination of size selection and minimizing the amount of PCR you do that gives you the, um, the, longest, the longer fragments. Thanks again for this very interesting contribution. We're switching to skiers actually to the next talk we will where natalie kinlock from simon fraser university will talk about adaptations to cellular immunity okay all right uh, thanks very much for the introduction and i have no conflicts of interest to declare so um, since 2003, a concentrated HIV epidemic has been unfolding in the Canadian province of Saskatchewan, uh, which is a prairie province located in central Canada, um, such that there are, as of 2016, there are 14.5 new HIV diagnoses per 100,000 people in Saskatchewan, uh, which is more than twice the national average in Canada. And there are actually health regions within Saskatchewan where these rates are upwards of 10 times the national average and are among the highest in North America. So this epidemic uh, in Saskatchewan has also had reports of unusually rapid HIV disease progression, such that um, less than 50% of individuals who've been diagnosed with HIV since 2007 in Saskatchewan remained alive as of 2016. And some of these reports have been among individuals who have typically protective HLA class 1 alleles, such as HLA B51, um, which also happens to be the most common HLA B allele um, in the indigenous peoples of Saskatchewan, who represent 80% of those infected with HIV in this province. So similar to the impact of transmitted drug resistance on the effectiveness of antiretroviral therapy, uh, transmission of immune escape mutations or HLA-associated polymorphisms that are specific to an individual's HLA class 1 alleles um, is known to accelerate HIV disease progression. And so this is because uh, immune escape mutations that are specific to an individual's HLA class 1 alleles are able to undermine the host CDA-positive cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, or CTL response, uh, which is a response that's critical for control of, of viral viremia. So what kind of environment um, leads to high levels of circulating adaptation to host HLA such that we actually begin to notice um, ex rate, like instances of accelerated disease progression? So in most HIV epidemics, the population immunogenetic diversity is relatively high, such that a donor and a recipient are unlikely to share HLA class 1 alleles. So in, say, in this example, uh, then the first individual will select for immune escape mutations specific to their HLAs, shown by the pink virus, uh, and then they transmit that virus onto, onto another individual who likely doesn't share HLA alleles with them. Uh, many of the immune escape mutations from the donor will revert back, and new ones will be selected um, in, the, in the recipient, as shown by the blue virus in the second individual. And this will continue as the virus moves throughout the population, such that the virus stays more or less the same at the population level. However, um, in HIV epidemics where the host um, immunogenetic diversity is, is comparatively lower, such as Japan or Saskatchewan, um, 
what we would expect is that a donor and a recipient are much more likely to share HLA class one alleles with each other, such that when an individual selects for an immune escape mutation, again in the first person, shown by the uh, blue virus changing to the pink virus, um, and they trans transmit their virus onwards uh, to another individual, um, there's a good chance that that those immune escape mutations are already adapted to the recipient's HLA alleles, which undermines their ability to control the virus uh, and therefore accelerate their disease progression. So, and this is true across the population. So given reports of unusually rapid disease progression in Saskatchewan and the knowledge that the population most affected by HIV in this region has comparatively lower um, HLA allelic diversity, um, the objective of our study was to investigate whether HIV sequences circulating in Saskatchewan are highly adapted to HLA alleles commonly expressed in this population, such as HLA-B51. So in order to address this, uh, we have subtype B or HIV subtype B poll sequences collected from unique individuals between 2000 and 2016 uh, from three different regions, uh, one of which is obviously Saskatchewan, uh, where we have about 1,100 sequences that represent uh, greater than 65% of all HIV, uh, all HIV infections in the province since 1985. Uh, and then we have a continental comparison data set of about 6,500 sequences from the rest of Canada and the United States that were downloaded from HIV LANL, uh, and a regional comparison um, sequence data set from the province of British Columbia of about 6,500 sequences um, that represent more than 50% of those individuals in BC who um, have, HIV, have HIV as of 2016. And so if we look at phylogenetic trees of these, um, of these sequence data sets, what we see is that the total tree height or the bushiness of the tree is uh, relatively comparable between data sets. However, that's kind of where the similarities end, and the tree topology differs quite markedly between, uh, between these data sets. And what I mean by that is that the Saskatchewan epidemic, shown in green, um, is punctuated by sequence clusters, um, where 60, or sorry, 78 percent of Saskatchewan sequences are reside within a, a sequence cluster. And this is in comparison to 48 percent of sequences from British Columbia and just 15 percent of sequences um, from our continental comparison data set. And we actually look at the consensus sequence of poll between uh, the rest of Canada and the United States and Saskatchewan. What we see is that this consensus sequence differs at nine sites, um, which is pretty striking considering poll is a relatively conserved gene and is known to, its sequence is known to be stable long term, both uh, in North America and globally. And even more striking is the fact that the amino acid at seven of these sites in Saskatchewan um, is a known HLA associated immune escape mutation. So what this really suggests is that there's high levels of circulating adaptation to common HLA alleles in this population. Um, so we wanted to investigate this further. So we looked at the frequency of HLA associated, poly like published HLA associated polymorphisms between in Saskatchewan versus the rest of Canada and the United States. And so those polymorphisms colored in green are greater than 10% higher in frequency in Saskatchewan relative to the rest of North America. Well, those colored in black um, are greater than 10% lower in frequency in Saskatchewan relative to the rest of North America. And so overall, these immune escape mutations are higher in prevalence in Saskatchewan um, th than the rest of Canada and the United States. So this is true, but an HLA allele typically doesn't just select for a single polymorphism across the HIV genome, uh, and even within a specific region of poll. Um, so when an individual actually transmits their sequence onwards, they're transmitting not one mutation, but multiple that their alleles have selected. So what we really want to know is how adapted are circulating sequences as a whole, or at least across this region of poll, to HLA alleles. So we investigated this for 34 HLA alleles that actually have an immune escape mutation over this region of poll, um, using a published metric that scales adaptation between negative one, which indicates no selective pressure, uh, and positive one, which indicates complete adaptation. And so what we see overall is that HLA-specific adaptation um, is, hi is higher in Saskatchewan relative to the rest, uh, rest of North America. And this is particularly true for seven HLA alleles that are, um, that are labeled here. Um, and interestingly, the um, many of these alleles also happen to be those that are highly prevalent in indigenous peoples of Saskatchewan, uh, where in this graph of pre the prevalence of HLA-B alleles um, in indigenous peoples of Saskatchewan, those highlighted in blue actually have a polymorphism in, in this region of poll for us to investigate. And so what this means is that a Saskatchewan resident who expresses HLA-B07, B1501, B3501, and or HLA-B51 um, has a greater than 75% chance of being infected with HIV that's inherently capable of evading their CTL response. And this is particularly bad because greater than 70% of indigenous peoples in Saskatchewan who represent the at-risk population here, or most at risk, um, express at least one of these HLA alleles. So there's high levels of circulating adaptation in Saskatchewan. Um, but how did, how did this actually happen? 
And so our hypothesis is that following selection, HLA-adapted variants are persisting upon transmission to new hosts, and that these strains are being transmitted widely and frequently. So what we would expect is that HLA-adapted variants are one, increasing in prevalence over time, and two, are enriched at will be enriched among HIV sequences located within versus outside phylogenetic clusters, which are hotspots of transmission. So getting at the first point, we looked at the prevalence of HLA-associated HLA immune escape mutations over time in Saskatchewan. Um, what we see is that for 7 of 15, show, um, high, or with, highlighted with the solid line, um, increased, the prevalence increased significantly over the, between 2000 and 2016 in Saskatchewan. Uh, for seven others, there's also an increase, although not statistically significant, and one decrease, and this is also not statistically significant. And so getting on my second point about whether or not these adapted variants are actually enriched in, sequ in Saskatchewan sequence clusters, I'll use a specific example to illustrate my point. And that is selection of reverse transcriptase uh, S162C uh, by HLA BO702 and BO705, uh, which has a prevalence in Saskatchewan of greater than 80%, and um, in the rest of Canada and the United States of about 25%. And so 91% of sequences in Saskatchewan sequence clusters harbor the RT-S162C mutation. And this is compared to only 50% well, le less than 91% of sequences located uh, outside sequence clusters in Saskatchewan, giving an odds ratio of this mutation being located in a sequence cluster of 9.6. And this is highly statistically significant. So we then rationalized that the odds ratio of being located in a sequence cluster in Saskatchewan should correlate with the enrichment of an immune escape mutation um, in Saskatchewan relative to the rest of North America. And so this is exactly what we see. Uh, we see a strong statistically significant correlation between the odds of being located in a sequence cluster and the enrichment of the immune escape mutation um, in the population. So in summary, um, circulating HIV sequences in Saskatchewan are highly adapted to the HLA alleles of Indigenous peoples who make up 80% of the at-risk population in Saskatchewan. And HLA-adapted variants are being widely and frequently transmitted. And I think what this work really underscores is the urgent, urgent need to address the HIV epidemic in Saskatchewan um, because things are worse than we already thought. And this is going to really take combined efforts of communities who are affected by this and public health officials and health professionals in government um, to bring about appropriate and effective and culturally sensitive change um, to try and end this. Um, acknowledgements. Um, Big acknowledgments to my supervisor, Dr. Zabrina Brume from SFU, and uh, Dr. Jeff Joy uh, from the BC Center for Excellence and HIV AIDS, who are really the driving force behind this work. Um, other folks from our lab at SFU, as well as our collaborators from University of Saskatchewan, University of Regina, uh, UBC, and the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, to our funders, and finally to the conference organizers for allowing me to speak today and for also providing me with a scholarship to attend this meeting. Uh, thanks very much, and I can take any questions. Thanks for this interesting contribution. Are there questions? I have yes, there. question. Um, you might expect a virus passing through uh, individuals with so much pressure that might have an, an effect on the fitness of the virus and given the heritability that we see in viral load. Um, is there anything special about these viruses in terms of their fitness or viral load to set points? Um, we I don't have access to any clinical data for the sequences, so I can't comment. Sorry. So you have no virus load data? For we these? have no viral load okay. data. No. I have a question. Uh, hi, Adam Bergener, University of Manitoba. Hi. So this is completely unrelated to sequence diversity, and I'm just sure. really interested in what work is, what we know about um, mucosal transmission in other areas in the world, in Africa and in the U.S., and that mucosal inflammation, bacterial vaginosis, microbiome determinants, there's a lot of things that can affect transmission risk. And do you have any sense of what type of work is being done in Saskatchewan along uh, these roads in terms of, or what the contributing, whether those may be contributing to increased risk in uh, Indigenous peoples, and um, is this something that's being examined at all? Um, do you know? I don't really know. What I do know is that the sort of the biggest risk factor is injection drug use, so mm -hmm. perhaps the contribution of mucosal, like mucosal inflammation is perhaps a bit less. Um, but I don't know of any ongoing work. But are, I, are all the transmissions? No, I, I, I have no idea how, what ex the transmission is for each of these people. But like it's in Saskatchewan, the biggest risk factor, like 60%, I think, of uh, HIV infections are through injection drug use. So, but I'm sure mucosal is also very important. But I don't know of any ongoing work. There's one more question. 
particularly present in 70% of the indigenous population. What is the proportion in the general population of these alleles? Sure. Um, so the alleles I showed you where there's some indigenous people have a 70% chance of having one of those alleles. Um, they don't have a 70% chance of like, like 70% is not for one particular allele that's overall. Um, so some of these alleles like HLA-B51 is at I think a, between a 20 and 30% um, prevalence in in indigenous peoples in Saskatchewan where that's like much less in the general population in North America. So my, yeah, my question was, is, is there a significant difference in the proportion of these alleles in the indigenous communities? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Yes. And were these results shared with the communities in Saskatchewan? I actually, uh, yes. Yes, my, my PIs are nodding, so yes. Great, thanks again for that fascinating contribution. Thank you, so we'll go to the next speaker, Marit van Rils from Amsterdam also, uh, who is going to talk about the efficacy of BNAB uh, PGDM1400 against HIV-1 in a humanized mice model. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so indeed, I will talk about the protective efficacy of the protein designing antibody PGDM1400. Uh, so I have this disclosure, so I'm on the patent of PGM1400. Um, so why are we talking about broadly neutralizing antibodies? Because broadly neutralizing antibodies are part of the immune system against HIV, and about 20 to 50 percent of HIV-infected individuals make these broadly neutralizing antibodies that can neutralize various heterologous viruses from different subtypes uh, within two to three years after infection. And so these antibodies can uh, be used to uh, design vaccines or even to also have as additional therapeutic uh, um, possibilities. And also about 1% of all HIV infected individuals can even make very potent and broad uh, neutralizing antibodies that can neutralize the majority of HIV viruses very uh, potently. And these patients are now called elite neutralizers. They sometimes even develop these really good potent antibodies within one year after infection. So these patients are of uh, real interest in understand how these antibodies are developed and also uh, how they, which part of the virus they target, um, and, but also can uh, have a additional uh, use in the field. So many uh, groups in, the, uh, in research are investigating these broadly neutralizing antibodies and are isolating them, and one of the key uh, patient populations to isolate these antibodies from are elite neutralizers. Uh, so, uh, a broadly neutralizing antibodies target the virus using uh, by the binding uh, to the envelope glycoprotein. And so, what you can see here in gray is that the envelope glycoprotein on the surface of the virus, and then the colored blobs are all these broadly neutralizing antibodies targeting the virus in different ways, um, already showing that uh, the glycoprotein has. Uh, many different epitopes that can be targeted by neutralizing antibodies. So when we then look at all these neutralizing antibodies that have been isolated so far, so up to about 200 of these broadly neutralizing antibodies have been isolated so far, and we show here some of the most potent ones. Uh, so you can see here that at very low concentrations, uh, they can already neutralize up to 80, 90 percent of circulating viruses that have been tested uh, in the lab. Um, so. One of the possibilities as well is to use these uh, antibodies to see if we can block transmission. Um, so this has been uh, studied intensively uh, for some of these antibodies in non-human primates. So what they did was they gave these, uh, one of these broad neutralizing antibodies, PT121, at different concentrations to non-human primates and then challenged these macaques uh, with a shift um, as of 160 p 3 and what you can see is that high doses of these antibodies can prevent infection as there is no viral load detected. Um, when there's a control IgG, there is uh, uh, um, infection in all of these animals. So this is one of the studies, but then when you combine all of the different trans um, um, prevention uh, studies in non-human primates, you can see a very nice correlation that the potency of these antibodies in vitro against the challenge virus is directly correlated with the amount of protection in the animals. So this really shows that neutralizing capacity of these antibodies uh, is correlated with the prevention of infection. Um, however, we are still investigating in the field many more antibodies. We are still isolating antibodies, and that's because we still are 
uh, have questions about how are they developed, what type of characteristics have these broadening genetic antibodies, and especially from these elite neutralizers. So what I've been doing is I have set up a, a technique to isolate broadening genetic antibodies from patients. So doing fax flow uh, sorting, we've sorted IgG positive uh, memory B cells and then stained them with an HIV envelope called BG55 SOSIP that is a native-like trimer structure or just a GP120 of uh, clade B uh, GRCSF. What you can see is that a small population or population of B cells recognizing just a GP120 and as a population only recognizing the trimeric structure of the protein, uh, really showing that um, these ones are probably the, the neutralizing antibodies because the GP120 uh, shows a lot of non neutralizing epitopes as well. So then we uh, uh, cloned and um, produced these antibodies, characterized them, and what we found was a PGM 1400. So PGM 1400 uh, targets the top of the trimer, um, and it's called the apex. And what I've already showed in this figure is that PGM 1400 here is very potent against many different circulating viruses, up to 80% of circulating viruses at a very low concentration, uh, making this antibody um, very useful also for therapeutic uh, applications. So uh, the aim of this study was to see if PGM-1400 can be used as a prophylactic or therapeutic uh, against HIV. Um, so what we have used is a humanized mice model. Um, most of these studies ha have been done in non-human uh, primates. However, uh, if a non-humanized mice system can be used, that can be uh, much uh, more efficient and cheaper um, in this small animal model. Uh, so what we've done is we have a high dose challenge in IP with these uh, mice and then I've administered uh, PGM-1400 antibody prophylactically or therapeutically. So first I will show uh, how the mice model uh, is um, constructed. Uh, so hemopilic stem cells from humans were isolated and um, they were injected in irradiated um, newborns uh, uh, of the NGS uh, mouse and then uh, this creates that uh, they were injected into the hepat uh, in the liver, and so the mouse will get a full uh, human immune system. So they have B and T cells and NK cells and uh, innate and adaptive immune system in these mice, uh, so that these mice are uh, then uh, vulnerable for HIV infection, as normal mice cannot be infected by with HIV, because they have now the human uh, CD4 cells. So what we have done is that we have taken these mice uh, 12 weeks after uh, trans. Um, after injection of the uh, human immune system, and then we've given the PGM 1400 at different doses. And then one day later, we have challenged these mice with JRCSF and then uh, taken uh, blood draws over time to see if the, we could detect viral loads. So first, I will show you the concentrations of the antibody over time in, off at day seven uh, in, after injection. And what we see is that uh, we're giving a high dose. We also see still a high dose of these antibody uh, in the serum of plasma of these mice. Um, so we want to see, is this high dose also protective uh, against infection? So now what we looked at the viral loads uh, one week post challenge, and we see that at the high dose, there's no uh, viral load detected, and only going for a much lower dose, we see, start to see some animals being infected. And then we have the control of PBS, and also we have an antibody that is not able to neutralize this virus that's also shown that it's not able to block infection. Um, so then we say that neutralization is the uh, component uh, of protection. So as we've taken blood uh, over different time points, we see that uh, at the first time point, the different groups have um, uh, protection against the infection. However, what we see is that over time, some more animals got infected, even uh, one animal in the 10 mg per kick uh, group, showing that there is maybe some occult infection going on because of the high dose, and then later on waning of the concentration of the antibody, and then the virus will grow out later on. However, still there is a significant difference uh, when we look at uh, the five weeks uh, after challenge. And uh, so for the animals that were not uh, infected after five weeks, we gave them another high dose to really make sure that these animals could be infected and it's not because the mice were unable to be infected, that's why they were protected. No, uh, we saw that all these mice were then afterwards uh, infected, showing that the protection was really because of the antibody. So then wondering, uh, we saw that there might be a correlation with the concentration of the antibody we uh, plotted here. Um, the concentration at 
uh, one week after injection uh, against the vowel load one week after a uh, challenge. And what we see really is that if there is no or very low concentrations of PGM4200, the vowel loads are much higher. So there's a direct correlation between the dose uh, of the concentration in the mice uh, compared with their um, vowel load of susceptibility to HIV. And uh, even when a bit more animals uh, became infected because of the occult uh, infection, we still see a very strong correlation between the concentration and viral loads at week five, really showing that there is a direct correlation between antibody concentration in the blood and the protection against the infection. So we were also wondering if PGM 1400 can be used as a therapeutic administration to also see uh, that it can be an ad additive to uh, current uh, art uh, treatment or maybe a replacement. Um, so what we've done is we have uh, taken the mice at 12 weeks, we've infected them with HIV, and we've taken four different HIV strains, all from primary viruses uh, from different clades. And then uh, at 12 weeks after infection, when they have a chronic infection, um, sort of, because the mice have a very short time of life, uh, we have uh, given them four injections, one each week, with a very high dose, so 20 mix per kick. And we've measured the antibody concentration also uh, during these times, and they have uh, very high concentrations of the antibodies over time. Uh, and they remain uh, high concentrations. So then what we looked at is the viral load over time within these animals uh, with the four different viruses taken. And what we see is that uh, prior to uh, the administration of the antibody, there is a very steady um, viral load, meaning that these, there is a a strong infection in these mice. Uh, we also see a, a, a short decline uh, in CD4 cells in these mice, showing that there is a real uh, infection going on. And then in the gray area is the administration of the antibody uh, at that time. And what we see is that there is uh, maybe in some uh, of these animals a small blip, uh, going, well, small decrease of viral loads, but most of the time the viral loads just remain. There's no change in viral loads, meaning that uh, the antibody was not able to reduce uh, the viral load significantly, even though these, an this antibody is neutralizing all these four viruses very potently, uh, we do not, not see a reduction of viral loads. Uh, this probably means that there is escape, very rapid escape from the virus from this antibody. This is what we have seen in other studies as well, is that the virus is very, very easily escaping antibodies. Um, so one of the solutions would be that instead of using only one of these antibodies, broadly using the antibodies, we could do maybe a combination the same as what we've been doing now with ART. And um, one of the very nice examples is the uh, tri-specific antidote that has been developed at the moment that uh, has one of the arms as PGD-1400. Uh, shows very promising results. So in conclusion, it shows that uh, the humanized uh, mice uh, system can be uh, used uh, as a model for prophylactic anti therapeutic studies, as an alternative for non-human primates, also because we have see very steady viral loads, um, even in non-human primates, sometimes that is not the case, and also we see a nice decrease in CD4 T cell counts, um, showing that there is a good HIV model. Also, we show that PGF4200 is able to protect against high dose uh, viral challenges, but we see that uh, when concentrations uh, of the antibodies are lower, also uh, when they have uh, declined over time, there is some occult or later infection going on. Um, uh, this is similar uh, to what we have seen in other studies. Um, however, the very interesting correlation is that um, PGM 1400 was now also being studied in non-human primates, and they showed exactly the same effect. There was protection with high uh, concentrations of antibody um, uh, with uh, the same range that we saw in the mice. And also what we saw is that these humanized mice systems uh, can be used uh, also for other uh, BNAP uh, studies. Um, they have used a little bit uh, different mice studies, biopsy mice or the BLTs, for instance, uh, but this mice model is very nicely as well. And then finally, we show that PGM 1400 uh, is not able to uh, decrease viral loads um, as a therapeutic. However, uh, maybe it will be as a combination, and that needs to be further studied. Um, and we are currently studying viral escape in these mice to really show uh, where the virus is escaping, which mutations are necessary, and then also showing that then the virus is not sensitive for these uh, antibodies anymore. So um, these are my acknowledgments. This work has been done all in the Amsterdam UMC with um, the supervision of Ben Berg, Hout, Rory, Sanders, and me, myself, and the funding agencies that helped uh, do all the work, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions? 
I assume this is a glycan uh, rich area. I know with the PGT 121 and uh, 101074, that's the V3, they're single point mutations that lead to resistance. This is also glycan rich area, do you know? Um, yes, so it's the glycans at 156 and 160. Um, right. We also see that uh, some of, of course, one of some of the viruses were not sensitive for the antibody. Do, do you have this glycan? So there's also some other residues uh, that see. can be changed. Uh, yeah. Is in your human uh, mouse model, do you monitor the immune system cellular composition throughout the the disease progression? Okay, because my question was that when you administer the the antibody, are there cells there that are responsible for ADCC? But if you if you like monitor those, then then it's my question's answered. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, during the whole process of uh, humanization, we uh, look at the percentage of human cells in these mice, and as well, also we checked a week before we did the, the studies, yes, and excluded all of the mice that were not having high enough threshold uh, of the immune system. Yes. Hi. Thank you for the uh, talk. Have you tried administering your antibody earlier than 12 week post infection? Um, so, is it, so that's my first question. The second question is Have you? try um, your antibody on mice that have already been uh, suppressed on ART? Yes, very interesting questions, and that's something we want to do in the future as well. So we want to see if the antibody has some additional effects uh, during ART treatment, because uh, it has been shown that antibodies can reach certain areas where antiretrovirals are less uh, active. Uh, so maybe that's also helping reduce the rest of our, So that uh, has been... Uh, is in our plans to do as well. And also treating them earlier uh, is also something to see too if there is a reduction in the viral reservoir formation. All right, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Right. Our next speaker is Rajiv Gautam. Um, we'll talk about also about antibodies. A single dose of anti-HIV anti antibodies can protect macaques from repeated mucosal sheave exposure for six months. Okay. So we are very far behind the development of HIV-1 vaccine, so we should look for some novel approaches to prevent HIV-1 transmission. And I believe like one of the logical alternative strategies to use the broadly neutralizing antibodies called BNAPs. So I think in near future, as you are getting a flu shot, so you just go there and get a BNAP shot, and then it should be okay for nine to 12 months, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So it was a common practice earlier before the development of HEP-A vaccine to have a shot of HEP-A IgG. So the travelers used to take a one shot, and it used to last for three to four months. So on the basis of this idea, we hypothesize that we can use these BNAPs as an arsenal, which can mirror the same hepatitis A IgG effect. And we can have a protection for several months to a year. So I won't uh, go in the details of BNAPs since previous speaker told a lot about the uh, BNAPs. So we have roughly five defined targeted, and so um, I will talk, talk about the three antibodies, of which two are targeting the CD4 binding site, and one is the V3 glycan, and to be precise, it is a 101074 targeting the N332 super site. So how to use these BNAPs? So since I work with monkeys for a long, long time, so, so we have uh, developed a, one R5 tropic simian HIV virus, and uh, this is just a brief uh, background of this virus because uh, we use it for our challenge purposes. So what happened, like we use the HIV-88 envelope in the genetic backbone of MAC-239. And when we inoculated this virus into monkeys, so we see a very high viral loads in the acute phase from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7th peak of viremia, and then we do see a very good set point of viremia, 10 to over 2 to 10 to the power 5. And thus, when we look for the CD4 T cells, then there is a irreversible depletion of CD4 T cells. And majority of the animals progress through AIDS. And, and this challenge virus is susceptible to virtually all neutralizing antibodies, 
including the three uh, antibodies which we use for our studies. As we can see, these are the two 3BNC117 and 1074, which are similar in activity, but they both are more potent than the VRC1. So as we know, majority of infection uh, takes place via the mucosal route, and moreover, uh, their humans are being exposed to a very low amount of virus uh, for several times before becoming infected. So in order to mimic our real, real life situation, we asked ourselves, can these BNAPs prevent virus acquisition in a repeated low dose challenge model in rhesus macaques? So what is this low dose challenge model? So low dose challenge model is like, uh, we just uh, inoculated the 10 TCID50 of our virus intrarectally every week till the animal get infected. And when we calculated the infectious dose, then it was estimated to be 0.27 AID50. AID means the animal infectious disease 50. And the, all of the macaques used in our studies were all uh, protective alleles free. That is, they were AO1 and AO2, BO8, B17 negative. So this is our study design. So we used uh, all three antibodies at a, a dose of 20 mix per kg body weight. And all the antibodies were given intravenously. And uh, how to study, then the, we just look for the number of virus challenges required in the monoclonal antibody recipient groups compared to the controls. So this is just a control showing how our uh, low dose the interactive challenge works. As we can see, uh, oh sorry. Um, the majority of the animals were infected within two to six challenges. So, um, and uh, on the right side, you can see a kaplan meier curve where the percent of animals uninfected is plotted against the number of challenges. So these are, uh, this kaplan meier curve shows the protective efficacy of all the three antibodies. As we can see, there's a significant number of challenges were required to infect the monoclonal antibody receiving animals compared to the controls. And we can see that 3 bnc 117 and 101074 uh, were better or more potent than the VRCO1. As they took uh, uh, a median number of challenges in both the groups were 13 compared to the VRCO1, which has a median number of challenges to be eight. So as we know now, there are long-acting uh, monoclonal antibodies where you can just do two mutations in the FC domain of antibody. So we do just two, uh, we made two challenges, like the M is replaced with the L and N is replaced with the S, and that's how the LS word has come. So we try to replicate the same study uh, like we did in the native form of antibodies. Here we had a VRC1 LS, 3BNC117 LS, 10-1074 LS, and at the same dose and the same route, that is 20 mix per kg and intravenously. And the same uh, study design. So this is one of the representatives of uh, the three monoclonal antibodies we used. This is showing the 10-1074 LS monoclonal antibodies. As we can see, and the monkeys uh, took challenges, uh, about 17 to 36 challenges. And I will just stress out, like, uh, th this was just a single dose. So as you can see, the last monkey took a 36 challenges. It is close to the eight to nine months. And uh, when we plot it in the kaplan meier curve, this solid line is the LS form of the antibody, whereas the dotted line is the native form. As you can see, the LS form took 2.2 fold higher number of challenges compared to the native form. And when we plot all the antibodies so far we used, native as well as the LS forms, you can see that 10, 10, 74 LS stands out, which is, which is around 37 weeks. And on the whole, like the LS forms are more uh, durable than the native forms of antibodies. So these are the um, neutralizing titers because we looked for the neutralizing titers and the antibody concentration longitudinally over a period of 40 weeks. 
and um, this is showing that uh, this is a heat map where the red is showing the uh, neutralizing titer of more than 1,000. Yellow is around 100 to 999, and the green shows uh, less than 20. So again, I will point out this particular monkey where you can see, like even we could able to see a neutralizing activity till 36 weeks post administration. So as we were talking about just now, the previous speaker was telling like they are more diverse, so we have to look for uh, the more combination because HIV is so diverse, so many clades, so many strains, and so many serotypes. So therefore, there is a need for the combination of BNAPs so that they can target the different epitopes of the envelope. And in the field, like uh, the intravenous administration is not so desirable, so people try to ask for something like which is easy to apply in the field. So subcutaneous inject administration is a another form which is far more desirable compared to the intravenous. So since there is a limitation of volume when we give anything subcutaneously, so so we are, as per the FDA and every, uh, FDA regulations, so we have to put down the volume less than one ml to infuse. So we try to concentrate our antibodies, and we concentrate it, and we reduce the dose as well. So, so we try to combine two antibodies, the 3BNC117 LS and 10.1074 LS. They both are very potent. So we reduce the dose by one third. Like instead of 20 mix per kg, we are giving this time 7.5 milligram per kg body weight of individual antibodies. And the study design is the same that we are giving antibody one week prior to the start of challenge and then challenge every week thereafter. So as you can see in the subcutaneous combination monkey, monkeys, five out of six monkeys took 16 to 24 challenges, whereas one animal got infected pretty early and it took only six challenges to get infected. And they were significantly protected compared to the controls and we also monitored the monoclonal antibody concentration over the period of time. This is one of the representation of 10, 1074 LS monoclonal antibody. As you can see, there's a gradual decline of monoclonal antibodies in some monkeys, and there is a fast decay of some monkeys. And this directly correlates with the uh, virus acquisition because on the right side, you see the viral loads. So this monkey uh, got a fast decline of antibodies, and we the monkey got infected earlier, where this monkey had a very gradual decline, and this took pretty long time to get infected. So as you can see, some monkeys are showing a rapid decline of antibodies, some monkeys are having a gradual decline. So when we look for the reason, the reason was the monkeys develop an anti-antibody response. Uh, so that's the major limitation of this model because the, all the antibodies are humanized antibodies and we are giving to monkeys. So there is a genogenic response there. So all these arrows you can see, like on the left side is the antibody concentration. Like you can see it, there is a rapid decay, like there's a very sharp slope of the antibody decay. On the other side, you can see, like because these three monkeys mounted very strong anti-antibody response. And the monkey, which uh, didn't mount a response, had a gradual decline of antibodies. So when we also look for the antibody concentration at the time of virus acquisition. This box plot shows the antibody concentration at the time of virus breakthrough. And the antibody concentration may, uh, were in the range of 0.1 to 1 micrograms per ml. So we use a probit regression model to estimate the per challenge probability of infection. So this probit curve is for all the monoclonal antibodies used in our study. So on the top, uh, there is a red circles which shows like the monkeys which got infected at the particular concentration. So this probit curve showed us that either the monkeys were for a protection of 99.1% or 1% infection is 2.67 microgram per ml which means that if a monkey is having this much amount of concentration, then uh, the 99% chances are that it's going to resist the infection. So to conclude, 
there is a hierarchy like, of these antibodies, which I just talked about, like 10, 10, 74, followed by 3BNC117 and BRC1. And the single administration of 20 mix per kg can increase the number of challenges by nearly fold fold. And LS change is made a tremendous uh, effect in terms of half-life compared to the native form. And anti-antibodies against the humanized BNAPs diminish their prophylactic activity in macaques. And I will say like this is highly unlikely in humans because there are two reports with VRCO1 and VRCO1 LS. When they were administered in the humans, uh, none of the subjects showed any anti-antibody response. So, and combination of uh, our LS form of antibodies by sub-Q root is a more clinical and relevant way. And these antibodies will be a better tool for a pre-exposure immunoprophylaxis uh, since we don't have any effective HIV vaccine. And I would like to acknowledge like uh, all the fellows in the uh, NIAID NH and our collaborator at Rockefeller University and other people who directly or indirectly help in our study. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? Um, I guess. <laughs> um, your challenge virus, is it, is it a clone? Yeah, it is a clone. Yeah, have you ever tried to get a, like those monkeys you showed in the very beginning that get chronic infection? to take a swarm, instead of using a clone, use a swarm of virus from a monkey that's chronically infected uh, and, and use that as your challenge? Because the clones are, are going to be relatively yeah, easy. Yeah, but, but it's very easy to study the clones compared to the swarm. So we are trying this one now, the antibodies, to do the in vitro studies because every swarm is different. Right. right. So we that's do have, uh, before making this clone, so we do have uh, like 40, 50 swarms from different monkeys. So we are trying. So it's very hard to judge like which swarm to pick because each swarm is having different in vitro activity against the antibodies. So we are trying like either pool together everything and just do it, this experiment. So we are thinking about it. So yeah. Can I um, ask, um, do, do you think possibly the, the uh, it's the repeated challenges per se that might be contributing to the depletion of your um, antibody either directly or through the formation of these anti uh, idiotopic um, antibodies? No. no. So the reason is like, first of all, people say like repeated low dose challenge may have some vaccine effect, but it is being proven like there is no T cell response. And yeah, there might be chances like, as you're saying, like indication of some immune complex formation mm -hmm. or something. So we're trying, but like, there's no hint like we are having any immune complexes right. because they just block at the mucosal site itself. So yeah, so that's the reason. And, uh, and did you see with the anti-antibodies, do you see differences when you're using cocktails or you've not used cocktails? Okay. Or no, do you, no, think, uh, you yeah. think there would be uh, okay. in the more cocktail, risk with cocktails? Yeah, when I was seeing in the cocktail, so somehow the monkeys were more uh, showing anti-antibody response against one, three BNC117 compared to the other one. There was a one monkey which was showing anti-antibody against both the antibodies, but uh, five were not showing in the 10, 10, 74. But all the six, five were showing against 3BNC117, yes. That we can't figure out like why it is happening, some intrinsic property or I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say because it's a monkey and like humanized antibodies here. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have a question? Yeah. Yes, so I was wondering, did you also sequence the viruses after infection to see if in your control, for instance, you have different mutations, uh, viral escape than after uh, when they got the antibodies? So maybe antibody specific mutations in there? Okay, so I'm not anticipating this thing because we haven't done it, but I'm not expecting like anything is gonna change because what happens in this case, as the antibody goes down, there is no antibody floating around to see the virus. Yeah, so maybe it's like intermediate level, so it's not 100% protective, but still yeah, has so, some so effect the, on the Yeah, virus. so in some cases, like where we see a little bit higher antibody there as per the threshold. So there we didn't see any change in the virus, not at all. So we uh, looked at the peak of virus four to six weeks after once they were acquired challenges. So we didn't see any. I, I, we did 20, 22 challenges in each monkey, so we didn't see any difference. Yeah. Okay. 
If I may, I have one last question. Yeah. About uh, what what side effects would you expect of such um, antibodies? I mean, would you expect or did you observe anything in the monkeys? Okay, yeah. So, like uh, in the case of these were uh, the VRCO1 and 3BNC117 has been done in the people, mm -hmm. and for six to eight months follow, they haven't seen any adverse reaction except one or two patients. They see some swelling or something, which we generally see with other, even with the tetanus injections, we see so, such, but they didn't see any adverse reactions. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I want to thank uh, all the speakers for okay. keeping on time and very good talks. Uh, thank to the audience and thank to the <laughs>